Okay, why don't we get started? Welcome everyone to the 4th event in our provost distinguished speaker series for the academic year. The provost distinguished speaker series is an annual event where we invite our recently appointed board of trustees, distinguished professors and endowed chairs to share their scholarship with us. As you may know, I am Carl Ledgeway. I'm the provost here at the university. It's actually just about my 1 year. Mark, and unfortunately, I still haven't met most of you in person, but I've had lots of opportunities to get to, to meet you all in, in this virtual environment. And, and it's really important that we continue to have events like this where we're able to bring our community together at a time where connection and, and being able to, to appreciate some of the brilliance of, of the people we have here at UConn is incredibly important. We are really pleased to share this opportunity uh, to bring our community together in appreciation and celebration of the exceptional work we do here at UConn. I would be remiss to not acknowledge the work that it takes to arrange this series, which has been managed primarily by Amanda Pitts in our office in partnership with Vice Provost Michael Bradford. I want to thank Sergio Luzato for sharing his scholarship with us today. He is the Emiliana Pasca Nother Chair in Modern Italian History in the Department of History in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. His talk today is entitled Looking into a Name, the Emiliana Pasca Nother Chair and World History. As I mentioned, I've been here at UConn for about a year and I still have a lot to learn about the university's history. In presentation and pr preparation for today's introduction, I looked up the history of this endowed chair, and I was really intrigued to read more about Professor Nother, the namesake of this chair. She was a professor at UConn from 1968 until her retirement in 1987. This was a time where women were significantly in the minority among professors. In addition to the contributions of her scholarship, which were extensive, her career paved the path for future generation of women scholars. An endowed faculty position is one of the highest academic honors that a university can bestow on a faculty member. It's both an honor for the named faculty employee and an enduring tribute to the donor who establishes it. This is certainly the case here with Professor Nother's legacy and the professorship of Professor Lidzak. And I am very pleased to welcome Professor Nother's daughter here today. Welcome, Monica. Thank you, Carl, and I'm so glad this is happening. And so we've asked Associate Dean Evelyn Tremble, uh, Tribble to introduce Professor Lozado before today. Uh, but before I do that, uh, there's just a few things I wanted to share about her. She's an Associate Dean for Humanities and Undergraduate Studies in CLAS, and she's a professor in English. She's a world expert in Renaissance era theater and with a particular focus on the work of Shakespeare. Um, with a little help from Dean Wade, I had the opportunity to read a bit of her recent work, including early modern actors in Shakespeare, Shakespeare's theater, thinking about the body, or excuse me, thinking with the body. This provides a unique look into the physical stress experienced by actors in a time when they combine their endurance with other skills such as wit to survive a workload that is far greater than expected today. And, and that's something that with how overworked and exhausted many of us feel right now, it's probably something that, that rings especially true. She's very passionate about innovative ways to assess student learning and innovation in the humanities. And she's a competitive hammer thrower. So it's now my pleasure to turn this to her to introduce us more thoroughly to today's um, really exciting speaker and talk. Thank you. Thank you for that generous introduction, Provost Lechue. Um, It's an honor to be able to introduce Professor Sergio Luzzato, the Emiliana Pasca Nerther Chair in Modern Italian History. Born in Italy, Professor Luzzato received his PhD from Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, as well as from the Etoile de Haute Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. He comes to University of Connecticut after 20 years at the University of Turin. He's written exclusively, extensively um, on both French and Italian history. 
His monographs on French history include, among others, Le Autumne de la Revolution, 2001, and Bonbon Robespierre, um, 2010. His books on Italian history, which have been translated into English, as well as a number of other languages, include The Body of Il Duce, 2005, Padre Pio, Miracles in Politics in a Secular Age, 2010, and Primo Leve's Resistance, Rebels and Collaborators in Occupied Italy, 2016. His book on Padre Pio was awarded the prestigious McGill Kundal Prize in 2011. This prize is awarded for, uh, to, for books that combine historical scholarship, originality, literary quality, and broad appeal. This combination of qualities precisely encapsulates the nature of Professor Lozato's work. His scholarship engages some of the most important events of modern history, the French Revolution, the Holocaust, the rise of fascism in Italy. Yet Professor Lozato seldom takes a direct route into these inquiries. The, um, thus his monograph on Robespierre is not on Maximilian Robespierre, but on his far less younger, known younger brother, Augustine or Bonbon, as he was called. His book on Primo, Primo Leve takes up not his experience in Auschwitz, but the three months Leve spent as a partisan in the mountains of Northwest Italy. And his book, The Body of Il Duce, begins where most accounts of Mussolini end, with the display of the former dictator's body strung up in a Milanese piazza. Thus, Professor Luzzato explores the gaps in our histories, showing how moments of willed or inad inadvertent forgetting are crucial to the construction and deconstruction of cultural memory. I asked Professor Luzzati about his future projects, which promise to be as exciting and original as his past work has been. The first of these, he told me, is a history of left-wing terrorism in 1970s Italy, in particular the so-called Red Brigades, which were centered in Genoa, Professor Luzzato's hometown. The second project he describes as the story of the first global fascist, that of Antoine de Vellombroso, or the Marquis de Moray, Spanish by origin, Italian by birth, French by education, and American by adoption, who, um, as uh, Professor Lozazzo suggested, precociously tried to achieve white supremacy on a planetary scale. Notorious in his lifetime in the North Dakota Badlands in the 1880s and France in the 1890s, he is largely forgotten now. This makes him an alluring subject for a writer as gifted at the art of storytelling as Professor Lozazzo. I now invite him to speak on his chosen topic, looking into a name, the Emiliana Pasca Norther Chair and World History. Thank you. Thank you to the provost. Thank you to uh, the associate dean, particularly for her, her very kind and uh, uh, words on, on my previous uh, work and, and research. Uh, thank you to uh, Amanda and to all the people at UConn who made this possible. It is for me a, a real privilege of being able to do this. And uh, uh, so let's try to, let's, I, I will, I will, Try to explain why actually I chose such a topic when the, the provost first invited me to uh, uh, to uh, give a presentation in the in this series, uh, and so by, I will do that by starting with in my presentation with a blank, and uh, if uh, you can kindly confirm that now my video is on. Thank you, Amanda. So this is uh, a plague that I first discovered at Wood Hall uh, building uh, on on Storch campus when I first visited. And this is the plague which actually was offered uh, by the donors who were in the late uh, 80s and the early 90s made the very existence of this uh, chair possible. And uh, as you can see, this, uh, this plague actually not only lists uh, the different donors, but somehow witnesses to the importance of the Italian-American community in Connecticut, which is something that, you know, no, nobody would uh, readily think of, but in fact, which is very much the case. And uh, I will uh, try to show you here, uh, you know, very quickly, this uh, this map about Italian Americans and Connecticut and how do, uh, you know, the different ethnic uh, people actually identify themselves in terms, in terms of uh, ethnic uh, uh, descendants. And as you can see, Connecticut is very much, together with New Jersey and Rhode Island, 
these state, the, the state in, the, in, in the US where most people actually recognize themselves as Italian Americans. So I, I do think that the very existence of this chair matching somehow the expectation of the people who made this chair possible, it is uh, uh, it attests to their somehow to the pertinence of uh, of this choice by uh, Yukon uh, uh, at that time, and also to their I think to their insight of uh, uh, Emiliana Pasca, another whom I never met because she passed away. As you can see, actually tomorrow it will be the anniversary of her her of her death three years ago. But she, as uh, the provost remembered, she taught at UConn for a very long time. And uh, uh, and her family, together with the, those donors I showed you the list of, made the very existence of this chair possible. So when I was first asked to uh, somehow, you know, participate to this kind of academic exercise, and that is to uh, uh, deliver a lecture to a larger audience or whatever, and not necessarily specialized uh, audiences specializing in historical uh, matters. I thought, what I'm, what I'm, uh, what I'm going to talk about, and uh, ultimately I considered and I found that there was no need to search actually because the the very potential topic of of my of my presentation was already there, and that is um, the the trajectory of Emiliana Pasca Murder as an Italian American, as a, an immigrant from Southern Italy in the early stages of the, of the 20th century, up to when she became uh, basically what I am, and that is a university professor. But uh, as I will try to show, I'm, I'm going to be concerned here more with the prehistory, so to speak, of, of, this, uh, of this than with the history itself. Because as we all know, prehistories quite often are as telling as Historians, you know, uh, properly defined, so to speak. So uh, um, I I never met this person, but somehow I I do feel the the honor of uh, uh, of being in her of sharing what has been her path, and not only because I recently relocated to the states, and so uh, this is what I I going to 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 be trying to to with you today, and that is to present. The first segments of the life, but not just of of her life, but of the life of her husband, actually, because as you imagine, in this double name, Pasca refers to the Italian uh, family name of Emiliana, whereas Nether refers to the German name of her husband, and so this is what uh, the, the the somehow the journey to which I'm inviting you today is a journey through their encounter and uh, uh, I the reason why I'm able to do this because as you can imagine there in terms of archival documentation there's not much to be found out there although there's more than I would have expected but uh, one of the reasons why I, I'm able now somehow to share my findings or my impressions with you is thanks to the generosity of uh, uh, Monica Nether, who is the only child of Emiliana uh, Pasca and Gottfried Nöder, and who so nicely uh, shared with me some of her, you know, family archives. And so this is going to be including the photographs, which, you know, I'm going to uh, share with you uh, this afternoon. And so uh, um, somehow I think I'm, I'm going to be too quick because I was expecting actually this, uh, uh, to allow time for this lecture to be longer than it turns out to be. And so I apologize in advance if, if I'm going to be a little bit, you know, rushing from one from one uh, slide to the other. Um, but uh, and then also I didn't write a written version of this lecture because I think that it's it would have been just too boring for for the attendees to listen to a, 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 a you know the reading of a, of a written text. And so I will do my best to uh, to have you uh, you know follow me some, somehow in in this uh, in this. Uh, discovery. And so I, I will start then with uh, this war marriage. Uh, actually, by serendipity, I guess you, you may want to say Liliana, as she was known in the family, and Friede, uh, and that is Gottfried, uh, met when he was 27 and she was 25 uh, in a spring party at Columbia University in 1942. 
and uh, very kind of hastily, or at least, you know, out of a, 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 a very, uh, um, yeah, it was love at, 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 at first sight, you may want to say. And so they got married uh, on August 1st at the New York State Supreme Court House. And there, there was somehow one of those, you know, war marriages that people were wondering whether they would last or not, because for different reasons, you know, both American, female Americans and, uh, and, and males were willing to, to get in married before their men who were about to serve in the army would leave. And then, uh, so there was a kind of, you know, uh, yeah, in, in, in 1942, after the Pearl Harbor attack, many, many marriages were, were taking place. And so this, their marriage took place in New York in 1942. And as you can see, he had a uniform because he was already serving in the US Army. But they were coming from a much longer path. And this is actually the, the, the time prior to the marriage is going to be the first, the first part of my presentation. And that is how did they, how they, their respective trajectories somehow met and matched in, uh, in uh, World War II America, okay? So, as you are going to uh, find out, I guess, with me, the, the Nerder story is a common story. It's, a, it's almost a, an ordinary one uh, in, their, in, in its different uh, ingredients. And that is the, the emigration from Southern Italy, the persecution of European Jews, although, as I will tell you, uh, Gottfried Nerder was not uh, actually a real Jew, so to speak, but it was so in the, you know, in the racial view of the Nazis. And, and then uh, the U.S. melting pot, the fascist war threat, the American dream for both Italian and Jewish immigrants. This story can be told just as a thousand of others could. That includes eventually the following stages of this story, and that is the Jewish comeback and the Italian-American redemption. Gottfried's anabasis, his return as a soldier and ultimately as a victor, to the country he has hastily left as a 19-year-old presumed Jew chased by the Nazis, and the rise of Emiliana from daughter of a single mother immigrant from Naples to pioneer of a new generation of American women determined to, bake, to break through the glass ceiling of higher education. So on, with, on the one hand, you do have a very common story. On the other hand, I, I guess we have here an original story because the story of the Nerdist turns out to be original and it deserves to be traced back in time, far back to the, to the mid 19th century and far and wide in space, from Calabria to Scandinavia and from Siberia, as it turns out, to Arizona. And besides, this story is not just, just or only about wars, persecutions, migrations, global history. No, it is just about mothers and daughters fathers and sons, grandfathers and aunts, family sagas. It is at, at least equally as much about advanced mathematics and human socialism as it is about global history and family sagas. Thus, apart from the randomness of that Columbia party and from the serendipity of a meeting that might well never have taken place, the encounter of Emiliana Pasca and Gottfried Nerder was anything but fortuitous. At the crossroads of their individual destinies, historical dynamics operated and collective destinies were at stake. And this is mostly what I'm, you know, I, I hope I will be able to convince you of. Through this, you know, kind of gallery of pictures, which, you know, many of them are evocative by themselves. And uh, again, I apologize in advance if I'm going to be uh, to be a little bit, uh, you know, too quick in, in my presentation, but uh, there are so many things that you, you, you may want to discover about these two people. And so their story up to the, that date, 1942, in the States, the, these are lives which, you know, were, were lived in a totally separate. Uh, of course, they, the, the first time they met was just a few weeks before they would get married. And so their lives in the, in the previous, previous stages of their lives has and must be told separately. 
these were parallel lives uh, before being, you know, uh, the life of the couple. And uh, but there are some correspondences, of course, because the, and so the, the first correspondence is the fact that they bore, both shared the condition of having left something behind. And so what did, you know, what did Liliana leave behind as an immigrant in, uh, in this country? She immigrated when she was two years old, and that was 1919. And so the Italy she left uh, it was post-war, post-World War I Italy. Which of course was knowing, you know, very dire times and, and difficult circumstances. Although in theory, Italy has, you know, was a victor in one in World War One. But the entire dynamic of the fascist, you know, coming to power was uh, precisely linked to the way that people were not satisfied with the with the, the with the post-war, you know, landscape and uh, and the economic crisis was to, you know quite uh, quite uh, severe and uh, I guess there were also personal reasons why their their uh, the relationship between uh, Bianca Dramis who was Emiliana's mother and Guglielmo Pasca her father did not last and so this beautiful two years old child together with her mother Bianca Dramis uh, actually left Italy and through France, uh, they arrived in uh, uh, America again in 1919. But we do want to consider that this is a, the provost was mentioning the fact that, you know, the gender, so to speak, implication of this, uh, of this lecture. And I'm very concerned with the, that, uh, that part of the story. This is a mostly a women's story on Emiliana's side, because the two women their mother and the daughter arrived by themselves in the States. And uh, so they, they are represented not only of Southern I Italian immigrants, you know, in the melting, U.S. melting pot, but particularly of a, of a gender trajectory and uh, uh, achievement of gendered achievements. So she was leaving behind many things and uh, she belonged to a family where there were four sisters. And one of the sisters was Bianca that is uh, her, her, uh, Emiliana's mother, but the, the older sister was uh, uh, Maria. And they all came from a family of Albanians from Calabria, and that is Southern Italy, but not from Naples, from Calabria, which is, you know, the Southern tip of Italy, and Albanians, which, you know, represent a very interesting minority in Calabria and in Sicily, by the way. Uh, and you know the presence of this uh, community dates back, for, you know, to the to the early modern history and the, the different uh, stages of the Ottoman uh, Empire uh, uh, history. But interesting enough, these Albanians from Calabria were forcefully fighting against uh, in the 19th century against the Bourbons, which were you know uh, uh, in China, uh, were the the, the 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 kingdom of uh, it was a Bourbon. In the branch of the Bowman family was ruling in southern Italy prior to the Italian unification. And so when they first got here, Bianca and her daughter, actually they, they got here in the footsteps of the older sister, Maria, who had married another Albanian from Calabria, who was the founder of Banca Tocci. And Banca Tocci, as you can see from this picture, was one of these banks that were somehow taking advantage of the immigration business in, in the States uh, after the great immigration wave started in the early 20th century. So Bianca was, yes, uh, a, a single mother with her, you know, a, 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 an infant child, but she got here somehow, you know, taking, she, she, she was not alone, as it was often the case for, for those uh, immigrants, and she could rely on a very interesting family. The Stocci family was not only an, a family which was making money, basically, on the immigration business, but they were, they were also interested in culture, actually. And uh, uh, they, they were the founder of the Italian Book Company, which is the, arguably the main publisher of Italian books in the States in the early stages of the 20th century. So you see, um, for, for, for different reasons, Liliana, who you know, arrived here when she was two and a half, uh, she belonged to somehow were a privileged family uh, uh, in, in, in many ways. And then this aunt, Maria, actually, 
divorced for the Stocci and the, the, in the second marriage she, she had, because in the States, of course, divorce was allowed and legal, which was not the case in Italy. Uh, she was married, she married to a, a, another immigrant, a Napolitan, um, actually musician, and uh, who, whose name was Oreste Stagliano. And you can see it here, uh, Emiliana's aunt living in Central Park West, because I guess she was able to afford this, you know, thanks to the to the wealthy uh, position of her previous husband. And uh, so this is the world somehow to which, in which Emiliana was raised in the 20s. Music, you know, Italian opera, there were bo both musical teachers, Napolitan songs. This was this is the very moment, of course, when, you know, Napolitan culture and, and Napolitan music becomes so successful in the States. And so she was leaving behind many things, but you may want to say, eventually maybe not as much as her future husband was leaving behind uh, in, uh, in the interwar years. And so here we start with Gottfried. Gottfried was, bo was born in 19, uh, 1915, and uh, uh, actually he grew up in Breslau. He was born in Kasruhe, at the western you know, tip of, uh, uh, of the German uh, Empire and then uh, of the Weimar Republic, but the family, because of, of the um, uh, job of the father, who was a mathematician, Fritz Nerder, uh, quite, quite a, a successful one. They moved to Breslau at another frontier, and that is the eastern frontier of the Weimar Republic, not on the French side, but on the Polish side of that frontier, which of course was, you know, had plenty of, of implications in terms of, of culture, in terms of race, and uh, Goethe, uh, Gottfried had the, uh, Gottfried's parents uh, were uh, had their, an inter, if you want to put it the same way, a mixed marriage, because uh, Gottfried's mother was Catholic, and Gottfried's father, Fritz, was, came from a Jewish family, a, a quite established Jewish family from Bavaria in southern Germany. And so he had converted to Catholicism to get married to this very observant Catholic woman, and the, the two children were raised, as you can see them here, in a quite affluent manner in Breslau, but facing many things, and that is facing, you know, their, in their difficult circumstances of the Weimar Republic, and uh, quite uh, shortly, uh, the, you know, national upheaval of, in, in Germany, and eventually the seizure of power by the Nazis. But it did come from this very, and I, I found this picture, you know, really beautiful. This is the Fritz, and that is Gottfried's father, and these are the other siblings. And this is Amy, who, you know, arguably is the most important person in the family uh, 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 by herself, because she became one of the most influential, influential mathematicians in 20th century history. And she opened, you know, many ways in modern algebra and actually even in uh, uh, mathematical, uh, uh, mathematical physics or physical mathematics, mathematics in both ways. And so uh, uh, Gottfried had, had their, as, as you can see, there were two actually. Hermann was the older brother and Gottfried was the younger brother. And they had this kind of easy life of, 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 Jew, of Germans who were not Jews anymore who were thinking of being integrated all to, you know, just to discover what, to what extent with this was untrue once the, the Hitler, you know, got, came to power. And so what were they leaving behind? Basically, you know, the world of yesterday, the idea that, uh, that uh, cosmopolitan culture uh, and multicultural Mittel Europa would be viable in the in the modern times. I, eventually, I think that the fact of belonging to a, a family of mathematicians, because even the grandfather was a mathematician, somehow maybe you know helped them in thinking of the of this international dimension. And because you know the language of mathematics is, is universal by by itself, and so eventually, I think they had a, a harder time to to understand how wrong this you know was when the Germans, the Nazis came to power, and the two so talented and so gifted, you know, siblings, um, Gottfried's father, that is Fritz, and Amy, the aunt, had to separate 
and they both had to leave uh, Germany. And actually, they, f they fled in different directions because Emily, Emily fled to uh, the States and she became a professor at Bryn Mawr in, uh, in the Philadelphia area. And he decided to flee eastward, actually. And uh, he became a professor in, uh, in the Soviet Union, although he was not necessarily, he was leftist, but he was not a communist. But this is how, you know, math mathematics, mathematics were very, you know, power. I mean, the, 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 so the Soviet Union was quite advanced in mathematics, even under Stalin, actually. And so he, living at that border, maybe he thought that this would be feasible. And so Hermann and Gottfried actually settled in 1935 of all possible places in Tomsk, Siberia, Western Siberia, which, you know, had been a uh, Siberia. I mean, there were, were, you know, another multicultural actually environment because there were people from all over the Asian, you know, republics of the Soviet Union, but also the very place where political prisoners had, had been, you know, held since the, the, the time of the Tsarist Empire, etc. And so here you have, again, this, you know, we, we now have a new chapter of this life, find a way after, you know, having left those worlds behind. And again, even both these, again, are parallel lives, they both try to find a way in the most, uh, you know, demanding, and by the way, somehow interesting and, and challenging uh, circumstances. So, uh, Gottfried, the very Gottfried Nerder, from which my chair, you know, uh, is named after, through the marriage with Emiliana, he grew up in Siberia, in Western Siberia, in the, uh, in the late 30s. And unfortunately, he couldn't grow up. He did it with his father, we can, we can see here with his uh, Siberian students, but he couldn't grow up with his mother anymore because Regina, their mother, the Catholic mother, took, you know, committed suicide. She took her own life in 1935. And this is the family. And this is a picture taken at the time of World War I. And you can say, you can see the father with, you know, proud in his, his German uniform. So this is a story also of military uniforms, but different ones, because we discovered early on the Gottfried's US uniform, whereas his, his father had been the proud, you know, uh, own, uh, had proudly served in the German army. Actually, he even got the Iron Cross for his war merits in World War I. So, as you know, it is very often the case for these stories, these are, you know, heartbreaking stories of, of, uh, of uh, persecution, of loss, in any case. And so, you know, these are the two young and proud, proud children who actually had later on to grow up in Siberia. And uh, notwithstanding the terrible loss of, of, the, of, of his wife, Fritz was doing quite well in Siberia up to the mid-30s, and he participated, participated to the International Congresses of Mathematicians. And the one, the first one after Hitler's seizure of power was in 36, and he was in Oslo. And this is a, the interview, an interview he gave to a, a Norwegian newspaper in 1936. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't have time to read uh, to read you what what he eventually said in these interviews. Basically, he was acting and, and, and talking as a free person, as if he were living in a free country. Except that he was living in, you know, he was attended the Oslo uh, Congress through the Trans Trans Siberian Railway. But he his you know the two sons were still in not in any other place, but in Stalin's Russia on the eve of the Moscow trials actually, and on the eve of the Great Purges. And uh, unluckily enough, in the very Oslo where, you know, uh, Oslo, uh, Fritz Nerder attended the, the International Congress of Mathematicians, Trotsky was in exile. And so it became quite easily afterwards to, uh, for the Stalin, you know, nomenclatura to uh, um, include him in the Great Purges. And uh, sadly enough, the two Nerder brothers, Hermann, and Gottfried missed the father in, in 1937 because he was arrested and he somehow disappeared in the Stalin, I mean, Soviet prison, concentrary, you know, prison system. And they wouldn't know much about him in the following years. 
And what happened after that is that the friends of the aunt, the friends of Amy, mobilized to assist these two brothers in getting out from Soviet Union, Soviet Union and somehow, you know, getting free. Amy had passed away by that time. She passed away in 1935. But Albert Einstein was a very good friend of Amy, Amy Nerder. And he was among the many German, if you know, physicists and math mathematicians, and also American people, and the Quakers in Philadelphia who were, you know, developing humanitarian aid by that time. They were able to bring the two Norman brothers, as they, they you know, happened to be called, in the States in 1939. And so, uh, in the meantime, uh, Liliana was finding her way as well. And I found, you know, fascinating the idea of these parallel lives who were, of course, keep, which, of course, keep going, you know, un, un, unnoticed to the one from the other, but with all these correspondences, because secret correspondences, because they were, they were, you know, both they had left some much behind and they were finding the way in the most, actually in their ways in the, under the most uh, difficult circumstances. Because for instance, even you have here the two women, uh, uh, as they were living in, not anymore in New York, but in New Jersey in the thirties. And it is very interesting to find out how Italian Americans could be proud of, you know, what they were doing in the thirties uh, in, uh, in America. Uh, Bianca was a teacher, an elementary school teacher, and uh, Liliana was studying the public school system in New Jersey. And the relationship of these two women, I mean, we don't have much archival you know, documentation, but I manage, imagine this to be a complicated relationship also because the attitude of those two, you know, the, of two generations towards Italy and towards America couldn't not, you know, couldn't be more different, actually. And even the attitude towards fascist Italy because most of these Italian Americans were pro-fascist, because you know fascist Italy was a matter of pride, somehow, as opposed to uh, you know Italy in the, the previous Italy. And so, uh, actually, finding a way for Emiliana also meant that she would go to Naples, and she spent one year in Naples from 1938 to 1939, and this was the very moment where the racial laws was, were passed in Italy. And she was at the University of Naples, and while in one of the worst, you know, worst moments in Italian history before World War II, and that is where even you know Italian Jews became a para, para, para. And I wonder whether, for instance, how she reacted to the to the you know to the show and to the parade I'm showing you you here, and that is the visit of Adolf Hitler in Naples just three months after Emiliana first got there. And so uh, this, this was the Italy that Emiliana first discovered, fascist Italy. And uh, when she came back, still finding a way, she, made, she came back in 1939 as, you know, Gottfried. And uh, to, for her, finding a way also meant dealing with the, the condition of an alien, because she was not natural, yet naturalized as an American uh, citizen, uh, although she had been living in this country for the previous 20 years. And so at that time, she was at Hunter College and undergraduate in an old female, female college, and she was an enemy alien. And this is the kind of propaganda by the Office of War Information she was getting. Don't speak the enemy's language. Don't speak, speak American. Whereas the Italian language had been so important for Italian Americans as a, a tradition to stick with, as an identity tool, of course, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, this is the way this is the two different trajectories through which these two, two persons found the way. In, you know, very, as I can, as I told you, in quite, you know, under quite a dire circumstance. And then, you know, once they are together, and this is going to be the second part of my presentation, and I'm going to be, you know, necessarily much shorter on that part. Once they, which is even more interesting, actually, once they, they, they got married, and this is, Emiliana and Gottfried, when she got her MA at Columbia in 1943, they were able somehow to vindicate history and what they have been going through. And again, in different ways, in uh, respective ways, somehow independently from one, uh, the one from the other, uh, Emiliana became for a short but significant you know, number of months, 
1944, the secretary of uh, Mayo La Guardia, the, the very, you know, uh, colorful and influential mayor, Italian-American mayor of New York, uh, for, you know, the Voice of America broadcasting that La Guardia was providing through, you know, waves, through Britain, actually, through Italians. And in particular, she was in charge of sorting out, sorting out the correspondence that Italians from Southern Italy, because by that time, Italy had already been liberated. Many, many hundreds and thousands of Italians were sending letters to Mayo La Guardia, just as, you know, explaining him how, you know, their terrible the condition was, and Mayo La Guardia became somehow a mythical figure, you know, character in Southern uh, Italy, in 1944, 1945. And, you know, very interestingly, uh, Liliana was in charge of sorting the correspondence, answering the letters, and, uh, and, uh, and somehow, I guess, this shaped, you know, there was a second way of shaping, or third way of shaping, her relationship with uh, her birthplace, and that is Italy. And so, somehow, this, she was vindicated history as well, because La Guardia was so influential, and because, of course, the Allies were, by that time, liberating Italy from the fascist rule. Uh, Godfrey was vindicating history uh, uh, at his turn as well. He, he's even prior to becoming naturalized, as a, after having studied in, the, in uh, Ohio and then in uh, Illinois, and after having been trained in Arizona, that's why I was saying from Siberia to Arizona, uh, he, uh, he, got, he was uh, then trained in entire aircraft artillery training at Camp Davis in North Carolina, and his hope was of being able to apply mathematics. You know, his father was an applied mathematics specialist, uh, as opposed to his aunt, who was a pure mathematics specialist. And there was in, within the family also this kind of, uh, you know, balance or unbalance between the realm of pure mathematics and the application of mathematics to the real world, and particularly, of course, to the warfare and to uh, ballistics. And you know, uh, actually, even of you know, uh, intelligence and 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 uh, tracking codes through uh, mathematical tools, etc. And so, I, I think that he hoped, to, uh, you know, to become somehow instrumental in this war effort by the states. Ultimately, uh, they were not using him uh, uh, as a, as for his uh, gift, you know, his mathematical uh, knowledge, but rather uh, for his German language, you know, his condition of a German. Na native speaker. And so he moved to the UK and he was working as a censor uh, on uh, um, mostly on prison of, of wars, of war letters. And eventually also maybe on eavesdropping because there was also this kind of, you know, way of controlling uh, uh, the, the German prisons of, of, of wars. And so somehow I, I found fascinating this correspondence in 1944, these two young, you know, married people, they were separated, uh, you know, from the ocean, but they were, they were both dealing with letters, actually. And they were on a different basis. She was sorting out letters from Italy. He was sorting out letters from Germany. Um, and eventually he came back and he was uh, uh, trained, at, you know, as one of the so-called Ritchie boys. And that is people who were properly going to uh, uh, meet, uh, you know, their, the, in, in, to, to, to be recruited by the American intelligence. And I think, again, he was hoping to be used as a signal, that is, to track signals and codes. Uh, in fact, he was uh, employed in the human, you know, branch of the American intelligence, and that is, again, somehow human relations. And, uh, you know, uh, strikingly enough, uh, after having, you know, uh, after the D-Day the and in 1945, he got to Luxembourg, of all possible places, in 1945, after the end of the war. And uh, there was this very, you know, striking situation where the Allies had, uh, uh, you know, put all the Nazi top hierarchies who were not, who were still alive, after, uh, living uh, alive after after you know Hitler's suicide and Himmler's and and and, and Goebbels etc., they put the, the you know some twenty five or thirty Nazi hierarchs here in this hotel, which was you know with all these fancies and which was guarded, and they were basically interrogating them uh, as a way of preparing the Nuremberg trials, 
And, uh, you know, I think this has also been the case for this Jewish somehow uh, exiles in, in, in the States who, who were used by the American intelligence. This is how somehow Gottfried vindicated his Bavarian, you know, past, preparing the Nuremberg trial. Um, as, a, as a translator and interpreter, and according to the, you know, archival documentation I was able to, uh, to, uh, to address, he was in particular present as a translator when the Allies were interrogating Gehrig in, the, in preparation of the, of the Nuremberg trial. So this was quite a way of vindicating history. And another way of vindicating history for Gottfried was to follow in the, the, in the footsteps of the German, of the American um, army to get to Berlin in 1945. And this was Berlin year zero, of course. And there he was, you know, there were the Allies, but there were the Soviets as well. And this is, these are the very picture, pictures he was able to, uh, to sh sh take in Berlin. Each of them is so interesting. The stadium, I cannot, I cannot go for it. And post-war, uh, I will just leave you with this, you know, very sad images of uh, the Soviet prisons where ultimately Gottfried was able to learn that his father had been killed in 1941 under Stalin's order uh, uh, as, a, as a German spy. And all the others, you know, presentation I, would, I was preparing for you uh, concern actually the grandfathers and particularly, uh, and particularly Emiliana, Emiliana Grant's father. And that is the father of, the, of those four sisters, the Drami, Drami sisters, Albanians from Calabria. And uh, I, this is the grandfather. And he had the most incredible life as an opponent, as I told you, of the Bourbon regime. And he was fighting the so-called brigands in the first Italian civil war after the resurgimento. And he actually, not with his own hands, but he, he was in charge of killing uh, those so-called brigands who were somehow, you know, who lie at the origins of the mafia in Italy. For, for different reasons, and then there would be this display of bodies from the uh, from the you know Italian uh, uh, army. But Anastasio is you know the most possible interesting character actually, this grandfather. And these are the four men to whom he was somehow devoted and uh, and following all of them, because in the 1860s and the 70s, you know socialism, uh, democracy. Anarchism, who are not that separated, you know, as, as much separated that they, they will later become. And he was in particular a personal follower, first of Garibaldi, then of Mazzini, and of Bakunin, who you know, was very close to Naples and living in Naples, and of Marx. And, uh, you know, I don't have time to, uh, to, 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 for instance, to read with you this uh, excerpt from Anastasio's newspaper in Naples. And this is the very first translation of Das Kapital in Italian. And this is, of course, the English version of it. But Anastasio was, you know, talking about translations. He was, uh, you know, uh, the publisher of this newspaper who first, first, the very first in Italy, few weeks after the publication of the first volume, was publishing Marx in Italian. And that he was also very close to Bakunin. I have just a short quote here. Bakunin, in the very same time, Atanasio, this is Bakunin, one of the most influential revolutionary in Europe in the 19th century. Atanasio, you sleep. Shame on you. Time to get up and make a man of yourself. But I fear that I'm being unfair to my poor friend and I keep silent. Yes, it would have been unfair to say that Atanasio was sleeping. I, I don't have time, if not, if not for, you know, introduce you to a, a post-war Emiliana. And uh, this is a clipping from when she came back to Italy, another trip she made uh, after the war. And, uh, uh, and this is going to be my last slide. And I'm going to somehow to read it to you as a way of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, leaving you in terms of my presentation. At Columbia University, both Emiliana Pasca and Gottfried Nöder worked in the early years of the post-war period and of the Cold War on their doctoral thesis. She in modern history, and he in mathematical statistics. So they prepared themselves for what would be their careers in research and teaching. From the 1950s to the 1980s, both taught at well-regarded New England University, first in the Boston area, then at University of Connecticut. 
And in many ways, that's where their main story lies. If the nerders have a place in American intellectual history in the second half of the 20th century, they have it as scholars and as teachers. But as it is often the case of intellectual of their generation who were born overseas and became university professors in the States, prehistory proves to be as remarkable as East history or even more. The characters of Liliana and Frido are fascinating, not only at the time where they were made, where they made a name for themselves, but even more so at the time when they were almost nobody. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. What a, what a fascinating, <clears throat> what a fascinating history. Um, I, I, I think we have a, just a, a couple of, a few minutes for our um, chat and Q&A, but I just first wanted to ask folks if there was anybody in the audience, uh, you know, that's out there today that, that might have a, a question for you as well. Um, want to make sure that we, we get folks in who would like to, who would like to jump in. Um, sure. I certainly have some questions for you if nobody else is ready to ready to roll, but uh, but the floor is open if anybody is interested in a question. All right, well, I am interested in a question, and if anybody else uh, happens to be, just, just raise a hand uh, digitally, and, you know, Amanda might give me a, a shout. So, Professor, uh, once again, thank you so much. I am fascinated by what drove you to these narratives, to these two narratives. Of course, you you sit in this chair, um, which is absolutely fantastic. It is a fascinating history. What what drove you to want to focus on these two? Um, they're they're really historical narratives, just as much as they are personal biographies. Thank you so much for asking that. It's uh, I'm, I'm going to try to be short, but it's so this is so crucial, at least in my way of living my. My, my own uh, uh, actually profession and uh, also my uh, somehow research priorities. So uh, my, the, the first slide of my answer will be, I thought that this was all, all somehow uh, an obligation. I really wanted to, uh, you know, not just install myself in a chair as prestigious as it can be, but to learn more about the very place I was, you know, somehow relocating in, and uh, the, the 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 fact that this couple has been, you know, have been living for decades in in Connecticut, and uh, uh, doing the best, uh, you know, got to know as a statistician and and uh, Emiliano Nerder as a history professor to, uh, you know, somehow make their, you know, Yukon community, you know, improving somehow I think made me all the more committed to uh, knowing more about this legacy. And the second side, you know, side of my answer will be uh, more general. And that in, I think we, we are living in a time where uh, there's a lot of interest in, in history and in the past, uh, and also a kind of almost a, a, a fashion in uh, what, you know, you may want to call contamination in genre. And, mm -hmm. and so were, uh, you know, many very knowledgeable and successful scholars are somehow writing the story of their own, uh, uh, you know, uh, ancestors, and uh, they are applying uh, historiographical tools to, uh, to, to this matter. Mm -hmm. And I, I appreciate the effort, but I somehow don't uh, uh, own I mean, I don't have this, this kind of, I don't feel this kind of urge of talking about myself through my own ancestors. I mm -hmm. think that there are so many marvel things, stories to be told, which do not necessarily belong to ourselves because mm -hmm. we want them to be felt and to be read eventually as belonging to the human kind, to human kind. Right. So there's this, you know, in this discovery of, of uh, personal reasons to study history, I somehow want, you know, I, I would like at least, if not for the sake of just one single lecture, to show to my very respected fellows that any story is uh, worth telling. 
and particularly, you know, such a rich and compelling story as the nurse as well. Indeed, indeed, indeed. I mean, I was struck as soon as you began by Professor Tribble's notion that you 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 love to write in the gaps. Like, what is that that that, that disconnection in the gap? And I felt as soon as you began that that once again you were you were somehow dealing in the gap, right? And trying to fill in and giving the chair weight, the chair that you sit in its own historical weight, which I appreciate. We do have a question. Uh, Fiona would like to know if you could talk about the Italian milieu of, of New York versus Connecticut. Maybe the the intellectual, the, the Italian intellectual milieu between New York and, and Connecticut. Yes, actually, er, I, I am a little bit more knowledgeable about the New York side of the, of the, of the story than about the Connecticut one. And not only because I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking to you from New York where I live, uh, but also because I assume that, you know, in, in, as, in as much as this was a vibrant story in intellectual terms, it had, you know, it had first been the case in New York. And that's why, you know, the, that side of the story, the touchy side, and then the Napolitan song, you know, and music side is so important. And um, mm -hmm. by the way, Emiliana Pasca never lost, you know, occasion to remind to her in her articles yeah, something I didn't say actually, which because I stopped somehow when, as I said in my last slide, they became somebody, so to speak. Yeah. But uh, one very interesting, you know, uh, item, uh, I would say, ingredient of Emiliana Pascal's work is that basically herself had been somehow working on the on 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 her own, not in, about on not about herself. She never wrote about the story of the parents or mm. about uh, you know Atanasia. But she was driven to study history, you know, by this kind of background. And not only about that, in, you know, following stage, so she was raised as a specialist of 18th century and 19th century Italy, somehow sticking to her grandfather past. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at a given moment in her career, she became all the more interested in gender history. And somehow she was, you know, also in terms of mentoring students, she was, she almost became actually a gender history specialist. And uh, she was very, you know, committed to the association of uh, women in the university. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, she, you know, she's in, in this very quiet, I guess, way of her, I, I never met her, but I, uh, I mean, apparently from the pictures, you, you would say that she was a quiet person. Actually, she was a fighter. And she was, <laughs> you know, and she was a militant in terms of uh, opening up uh, uh, American uh, higher institutions to women, and Indeed. she was particularly interested in female immigrants, mm. which you know by themselves are, are so important. Irish, Im you know, female immigrants, Jewish female immigrants, uh, Italian. So, you know, the story is, ja is there. It is the best to be told. Indeed. 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 Well, I know that we just have a couple of minutes left, but I really have to ask this question, and um, I would love to hear your your thoughts on it before we leave out. And I'm just very curious on what was the America that she found when she arrived at two years old? Uh, sorry, Michael, Did, uh, Amanda, are you able to manage the chat? Because I wouldn't know how to read the other questions in the chat right now. And so I would hate to, you know, missing some uh, further questions, I hope. Um, so, in you know what, actually, there is one more question. Let me read it to you. Uh, this is you. a great talk, Sergio. Tell us a bit about Nother's post history in the 1950s. How did they feel given their international cosmopolitan um, and left leaning background about Cold War conventional uh, US policies in the 1950s? Yes, and uh, thank you for asking that. Uh, is, it, is that Manisha? My, that is, uh, yes, Manisha. Okay, Manisha, my very esteemed uh, fellow, and by the way, endowed chair at the history department. Thank you for asking that. And it is so pertinent. Actually, the reason why uh, Emiliana Pasca traveled to Naples 10 years after, not anymore fascist Italy, but liberated Italy in 1948 49. And that's where we do have her letters, because uh, the, uh, her daughter, Dr. Monica Nerda, was, very, you know, so kindly shared my. Her correspondence with uh, with her husband with Gottfried post war, and that's where you know her project became interesting and pertinent to the question. She was finishing her doctoral dissertation, which eventually she published in the early fifties. But she was still so taken from the ambiance, 
which of course was the political ambiance, not only because of McCarthyism uh, or for you know uh, 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 American history, but also on the on the European side. This was the moment where Cold War and Soviet Union, which of course was so you know have been so you know sadly and terribly important in the in the story of the family through Fritz another fate. So it is my understanding that this couple was once more trying to find their way in political terms. Emiliana was planning to write a book on uh, so social democracy in parenthetical, and that is late 40s, early 50s. And she was interviewing the leaders of the Social Democratic Party in Italy, as opposed to the social and the, and the communist one. So I think that somehow they were still trying to find a way. And even, you know, and, and in that sense, they were inheriting from their, you know, relatives because both Fritz and Amy had been leftist, but never in the communist, you know, sense of the word, always trying to find not a moderate, but a viable and humane way to make things better. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, well, friends and uh, colleagues, I am sad to say that that we are out of time today, but this is an absolutely fascinating conversation. I want to thank you all for spending the time coming in to join Professor Rosado. I want to uh, especially thank you uh, for coming in and uh, gracing us with this conversation. We so we so appreciate it. Um, once again, thank you everyone for coming and hopefully you can enjoy the rest of the day. There's still some sunshine left out there uh, to enjoy. Um, thank you to you all. Very, very many, many thanks. Have a nice evening, all.